Welcome to Puro Politics, the political podcast of the San Antonio Express News. My name is Gilbert Garcia, opinion writer and columnist, and I'm joined by Kerry Clack, columnist, editorial board, Metro editor Greg Jefferson. And uh, we're we're joined today by a special guest. Uh, really happy to have former Bear County judge, former San Antonio mayor, former state senator, and former state representative Nelson Wolf joining us. Uh, judge Wolf, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I'm glad to be here and join it. We, uh, of course, we're, 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 we're talking to you about a new book you have called 95 Power Principles, Strategies for Effective Leadership in Local Government. I mean, how many books is, is it? Eight or nine or something? Yeah, I think it's nine. Yeah, yeah. nine. Uh, I just got a habit of going home and just starting writing. <laughs> well, you know, and, and the, 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 the previous books you, you've written, I think, have been really interesting inside looks at how government functions at the county level, the city level, uh, you know, different uh, yeah. time periods in our in our local history. And this one has elements that it has, it has, uh, you know, vignettes about some of the things that, that happened. Yeah. Uh, but it also is kind of like a, a how to manual for somebody who's interested, um, in, in being a, a local leader, being involved in local government. What gave you the idea to take this approach with this book? Well, I, I've really been working on this about five years. I mm -hmm. guess I started thinking about it and, um, and when you're leading a local governmental entity, the city, the county, or maybe another major entity here, it's much more complicated than, say, serving in the United States Congress or the, or, or, or the legislature. It's child's play compared to what you have to do as a leadership, because it's not just your governmental entity. You have to associate with all of the other governmental entities as well as all of the nonprofits and other elements that are in it. It's much more complicated process. So these 95 principles, are, uh, they're, they're pieces of that because it's a lot more complicated. If you're just going to go serve in the legislature, you probably don't need something like this. But if you're trying to build something in the community and trying to move it forward, uh, it's a lot of little different pieces that you have to consider when you're, when you're doing that and you have to be able to exercise on those. Yeah. And, and I mean, in, in both for both the mayor and the county judge, you had to really kind of sort of try to find power with that. Maybe isn't there That's right. in the job. You almost have to kind of kind of create a certain. You uh, do. Uh, both both entities, the power is just not there for you unless you create it. Uh, the mayor is a weak form of uh, mayoral government. Mm -hmm. City manager is the most powerful per person there. So if you can't show leadership. And you can't show you can put six votes together and you can't show that city manager that you're moving this forward and yep. he needs to come along. Well, then you're not going to get anything done. Uh, Henry Cisneros taught us that early on back in the 1980s. Same thing with county government is such a mess of different, <laughs> different entities and different elected officials. So it takes a while to put those pieces together to try to move it forward. And uh, that that's part of the leadership issue, how do you exercise power when maybe you don't have some real inherent uh, uh, authority to do that? You, uh, one of the things you mentioned early on in the book, one of the lessons is to establish a political beachhead for yourself if you're thinking about running for mayor, for example. And, and, and that was when you, after you had served in the legislature, you kind, of, you kind of did that for yourself. You ended up on city council and then you ended up yeah. running for mayor. With that in mind, we're already kind of thinking ahead to the 2025 mayoral election. Mm -hmm. Do you, th people have wondered, we're gonna have council members running, they've, they've wondered if, if we're gonna see people from the business community also getting in. Do you think that um, given the need to, to establish a political beachhead, that it would be hard for somebody coming from the business community in 2025 to be able to jump into the mayor's well, race and do well? It's hard coming from the business community if you don't have any political experience. Um, I write about that it's best to serve on the council first and learn the ropes yep. and be able to get going. But there's exceptions to that. Take Phil Harberger. Mm -hmm. He was not on the council, but he was an elected official for a number of years and was on the fourth court of civil appeals and he had run for Congress. So he understood politics. He had a little, he had a base to come from, but it's hard for a business guy that's really maybe not related to the civic uh, issue very well. Uh, to build that base and be able to run, but it it, it can be done. Mm -hmm. Do you see anybody um, in the field right now for 2025 
who would be a good, you know, or acceptable to to business people. Can I add? Would, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to answer that because in in the book, you almost you don't make a prediction, but you 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 use history as a possible guide with you, know, you being a councilman from District 8 yeah. and Ron Nirenberg being a councilman from District 8. And That's so you right. actually say maybe history may repeat itself yeah. with Manny. So along with what... Well, it, well, it could because District 8 is unique. Uh, it's, a, it's a base to run from because within that District 8, you have the University of Texas Health Science Center, you have the hospital district, you got UTSA, yeah, USAA. So you have some large institutional uh, elements within District mm-hmm. 8 that reach out beyond District 8. So it's a power base to run from. Manny Pelias is obviously interested in it. So he starts from a pretty powerful uh, uh, base. Mm-hmm. And Greg was saying, your, your question that I interrupted. Is he the guy, though? I keep hearing that, uh, you know, from diver- different business folks that – they're still looking. They're not. They're not well, quite sold on, I, on Manny Pelias. I, I, I think you're right, and 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 don't discount. Um, there's three other council people running too, right. and they have a base of support um, huh. that that they could run from. I, I hear the same thing. In fact, I had one tell me the other day. They're, you're going to be surprised. There's going to be a person come out, and he's <laughs> going to really be strong. And uh, huh. uh, there are some. There are some that have built a base. Mm-hmm. Uh, Garden Hartman has built a base mm-hmm. because of all his civic work. So uh, somebody could pop up from there uh, if they have money. That's another advantage. I could have never won if I hadn't come from the business community when I was on the mm-hmm. council mm-hmm. running because I had to put my own money into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that could happen. But as each day moves along, that's just one day if they have less to to establish themselves as a, as a decent mayoral candidate. But mm-hmm. it, it, it certainly could happen. And some people think it's going to happen. One of the themes of the book is is timing. And you talk you talk about how you know, the, the need to to move quickly before your opposition yes. kind of forms. Yeah. You talk about when given the choice between money and time, take time. I think mm-hmm. you use the right. example of Phil Hardberger uh, with right. Main Plaza saying, let's not wor- let worry too much about the cost. We've got to move on this. Yeah. Thing, you know? yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, it made me think a little bit about what's probably one of the, the frustrations you had from your, your long career, which was the, the streetcar project. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> I write about my failures as well. Yeah, as yeah. Well, yeah but, but I, that one, I, I look at that one and think of that. It seemed to be a classic case where the opposition, it, given time, the opposition started to That's form. Right. Because it, I don't think it was really there necessarily early on. Now, maybe the nature of the project was such that it was going to be time consuming and there was no way around it. But do you look back on that and think there's anything you could do? It was do? very, very frustrating. And, and, I, and I think you're right. You got to act first. Got to try to put your opponents on their heel. I play a lot of poker. understand that <laughs> you, you can't win poker just calling. You got to yeah. be aggressive. The streetcar thing required, again, a lot of folks being involved. The weak link was VIA at that time. And they just didn't move. I remember sitting in the office with Julian Castro, and he was so darn mad. Five years, and you haven't laid one track? Yeah. <laughs> well, the longer you wait, the delays will kill you. When we did start, it was 65% support. By the time it got to the end, it was 65 against. And, of course, I drew two strong opponents because they thought they could beat me because of the unpopular uh, streetcar. Uh, so, yeah, time killed it. And I just didn't have the power within the VIA to get them to move and get it going. And uh, and even the mayor was frustrated. And so, yeah, time is a killer if you let it uh, go on a major project. You, one of the things you talk about, too, is that you, go to, you talk about the, the Toyota uh, uh, deal and uh, and the, the, you know, the manufacturing plant and, and the, the impact that's had. And uh, I think the lesson from that is... Uh, uh, moving into a power vacuum, if you see, if you say there's yeah. a power vacuum to move into that, and and you talk about, and I think you've talked about it before about how the then mayor Ed Garza was really opposed to Start. Toyota coming in initially. Initially, he was, and so you kind of you took the lead on that in yeah. in the, the negotiations, and I wondered if like how how sensitive that was for you because it, it had to have been a, a delicate situation when you're working on the negotiations and you've got a mayor who's 
really not on board at that yeah, point. I mean, you how, were known as the shadow mayor. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he finally came he on did. board, but initially he was not on board. And then you had the other complications. Two city council people were indicted uh, in that same time right. frame. So, you know, when you see vacated power and you see the governmental entity that should be taking the lead, not doing it, then jump in and do it yourself. And then that's what I did in that one. Um, a vacated power, that happens a lot because people are scared to take a leadership. Mm-hmm. You know, and I was going to ask you about, uh, I think it's 52nd or 51st principle, uh, Cicero always say yes <laughs> to, you know, people asking you, will you do this or will you do that? And you, your explanation, it makes sense and it's not it's not cynical, but there is yeah. a side of that, Absolutely. which could be seen as <laughs> cynical. It always. could. So, <laughs> it could. Uh, Hope, to snuff out hope, kills people. <laughs> and, and it may be something big or it may be something little. Mm-hmm. So I don't think you should try to snuff it out uh, if you see some way that it might occur. But in so many incidents, uh, you know, it goes away or it doesn't happen, the thing that, that, that you said you'd help on. Um, so, yeah, it can be a little cynical. But I have found that the worst thing you can tell somebody when they got a good idea is, hey, forget it, it's no good. Try to see if you can't make it work in some way, unless it's something you really don't want to do uh, or you think is bad. But yeah, snuffing out hope is, um, is not a real good thing to do. One of the things that you, uh, the lessons is to, to try to prevent uh, getting enmeshed in big labor disputes. And you say yeah. that Cheryl Scully was an outstanding city manager. Yeah. But my, my sense is that you thought that the decision, which I think she, the recommendation came from her, yes, the council, right. yeah. to um, initiate lawsuits against the uh, yes. police and fire unions over the yes. evergreen clauses in their in the contracts yes. that the city had agreed to. Which they had signed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that that was a mistake. Yes. And so, um, you know, when you look back at that, how should that have? Well, that that's a good example of where the mayor should have been taking a lead. Yeah. I, that that was the hardest thing for me to write because it spanned over three different mayors. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and none of them stepped up uh, and said, wait, this is, this is not right. Uh, they just didn't do it. And so that was a failure, I thought, on the part of the mayors not to step up and overrule the city manager. As you know, after they lost it, then they dropped the lawsuit. And uh, realize, of course, it's too late then. They'd already lost. Uh, but, yeah, that's, that was a failure of leadership on yeah. the part of the mayors to step up and say, Mr. City Manager, you're wrong about that. Did you see Cheryl Scully's decision to, to initiate the lawsuits and basically declare war against the unions mm-hmm. to really just, just gloves off? We're just going to fight it out. Was that the beginning of the end of Cheryl Scully? Like, well, and did you see that at the time or no? I don't know that I saw it at the time. I don't think I did see it at the time when it initially started. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it span over a long period of time where mm-hmm. there was plenty of time to correct that. Uh, it really put her in a political position mm-hmm. that she should have not have been thrust into. And it was, and in my opinion, it's the fault of the mayors not to step up and say, wait a minute. This is not a good idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, you shouldn't let labor disputes get out of out of that. Uh, uh, I've been through a number of them, and and uh, it, it's probably the worst thing that can happen when you politicize a labor dispute. And probably the the limits that we've got on pay for city managers really it's kind of yeah. an outgrowth of that because the the the, the fire union. In retaliation, yes, uh, got they, that, that on they the uh, limited the pay. I think uh, around three hundred thousand or so, and they put a term limit on it also. And I believe that's one of the Mayor Nuremberg's objective is to try to go back to the voters and to get that changed. Um, it's bad policy, uh, but uh, all that could have been avoided if uh, one of the mayors along that line had stood up and said, "Wait a minute, this is not too good an idea." <laughs> um, one of my favorite. Uh, chapter titles, uh, I'm, I'm going to probably get it wrong, but you 
say something about sports hustlers. Yeah. And, you, and, and for <laughs> Maywayne's listening who doesn't know the context here, you you got burned by the Florida Marlins. <laughs> right. Kind of flirted with Movie Sente. You got uh, uh, burned by Major League Soccer. That's right. Um, <laughs> Which and, is by far the worst. Yeah, that was that was. They should have gone to jail. <laughs> <laughs> you say don't let yeah. sports hustlers uh, uh, or don't don't fall for sports. Who I think you refer to as handmaidens of Beelzebub. That's right. right? Okay. <laughs> They're worse than the devil. The worst, the worst. <laughs> Don King was the devil, oh, and everybody no, knew I, it. I have a question <laughs> about King for it. <laughs> so, but I, yeah, but so, and I I think that the, you know that's a that's I think it's a valuable lesson. But obviously, it's very tempting when someone's in a position of power and they've got yeah. you know an owner of a of a, of a team. We had the, the the Oakland Raiders kind of flirting with, That's the, right. with the city that was years ago. One. <laughs> I think they were the Oakland Raiders. I call yeah, yeah, I call uh, them liars and made the paper over <laughs> so, there, and so they like, weren't too happy with so me. How, how do you <laughs> how do you resist that when you get a call from uh, from an owner of a, of a major league franchise who say, well, you know, we're really looking at something? Yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> it's tempting. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, when they do that, uh, but um, looking back on it, uh, I, I wished I had not spent four months trying to do that with the Marlins. Um, we tried that with the uh, New Orleans Saints mm -hmm. uh, because you can kind of tell if they've got in a in a in an area that's a good economic area, but they can't get their stadium built, uh, then they they start looking around as leverage to get them sure. to build a new stadium. Mm -hmm. I should have seen that. I should have realized they were lying and they were lying as best they could. Uh, this, the deal with soccer was a different thing. They they lied. It was that was a that was even worse than anything I've ever been through. I even hired attorneys ready to sue them because they kept a secret from you about a yes. clause. That, yeah, they had a clause in there. A guy named Pre Court was heading up the uh, committee to look at it. We had filed. Uh, he had a secret clause that he could move his team out of Columbia, Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, mm -hmm. and take it to Austin. Uh, they snag it around. So who, what happened? Well, Austin's got it. And who's the chair of it? Precord is. Uh, so it was a rotten, dirty deal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sports hustlers. And you mentioned <laughs> Don King. And one of the things yeah. you write is that, you know, Don King knew he was the devil. Yeah. <laughs> but the story you, the, the anecdote you tell is that, okay, we had the big fight in 93 between Julio Cesar Chavez and, yeah. and Sweet Pea Perna Ritica. And you're actually, you work out sometimes with Chavez. So you're jogging with right. Chavez and you tell King that you don't think he's in shape. That's right. And, and King makes a comment to you, something like, uh, you can't guarantee he's going to win the fight, but you, you you know who's not going to lose That's the right. fight. That's exactly and of course, right. it's a, it ends up being a draw. That's right. Very controversial draw. Some people thought that Ritter could won. And so I just came away from that thinking, wow, the fix was in. Yes. <laughs> you know, boxing's had that history all along. Hmm. And... Uh, it's probably part of it. And Don King was the champion of everybody. <laughs> He's the most amazing guy you probably ever meet. And uh, I've met a lot of hustlers playing uh, poker, so I kind of know what they're like. And uh, but he he made that comment, and Whitaker by far yeah. won that fight. And I think the sports magazine said the big robbery of the year. Uh, yeah, yeah, he knew he knew uh, knew what was going to happen. <laughs> Let's turn to a professional uh, sports team we actually have. <laughs> Which is, uh, the Spurs. The Spurs. Yeah. So a little more than two years ago, they they brought in Six Street Partners, a private equity yeah. firm from San Francisco, and Michael Dell. They changed kind of their governance structure, mm -hmm. and fans kind of predictably freaked out. Yes, uh, thinking that 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 was a signal that you know they were probably going to relocate to to Austin yes. at some point. And I remember uh, after that came about, they were seeking a commissioner commissioner court's approval to play two two games in yeah. Austin in the That's upcoming right. season. And you came out really strong and said, well, I mean, given everything that's transpired and all of the concerns, you need to demonstrate commitment to San Antonio. I mean, that was that was kind of the thrust of what you said. Mm -hmm. Did you really believe that that was a danger that they that the Spurs could leave at that point? Or were you responding to kind of everybody around? Well, you when all that started, I felt same way. Hey, they're going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I did spend a lot of time talking to them. Mm -hmm. Of course, when we did the uh, big center out there, 100 million they invested um, out there, uh, that was a factor. 
another factor was the fact that they've got a very good deal. <laughs> County doesn't make any money off the Spurs. I think we get a million a year after investing two hundred. By the way, is that too good a deal in retrospect? Did, a, did they get did they, it, did the Spurs that, get by with too much? I doubt if anybody's got a better deal than that anywhere in the country. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But you gotta understand the philosophy that Cindy Cry had when she was county judge. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna give them everything and I don't want any responsibilities. Yeah. You know, that's mm -hmm. not a bad thought because the Spurs have to keep it up. And, they did have to pay for some overruns on the construction. So that was her philosophy. Mm -hmm. Let them have everything, mm -hmm. secure the franchise here in San Antonio. So I felt that, that was good. And I thought playing five games somewhere else, uh, if you said no to that, aren't you just giving them a reason to move? <laughs> mm -hmm. And if they're going to move, they're going to move. Mm -hmm. uh, but now this other effort <laughs> about a downtown, downtown stadium kind of right. shows you, yeah, they want to be here. They want to look at what's the best deal for them. And uh, mm -hmm. to me, that was another, you know, good sign that they want to stay here in San Antonio. NBA hasn't shuffled teams around like some of the other NFLs have done mm -hmm. in some of the other professional sports. So mm -hmm. I think they're here. I feel confident about that. Whether they'll stay in the arena we've got now or whether the city and whoever else is going to build them a new one, I don't know. So I talked to you about this in early July. We were pre preparing to do our first story on yeah. on the, you know, the effort to get the Spurs downtown. Mm -hmm. And when I asked you about the possibility of them leaving what was then the AT&T Center, mm -hmm. you had a very uh, pungent response. <laughs> About, about the, I, about the, new, about that the is new arena. The, the dumbest blanking idea. <laughs> I, it, I might be paraphrasing, but it was close to that. It was it pretty was close. Pretty, pretty close. <laughs> pretty close. Uh, what were your reasons then? Well, and, and have your feelings changed since? Well, uh, for, well, first of all, the reasoning was that if we did, if you were going to blow up the arena we had now, that's one thing. Like the baseball, you know, it's going to move because uh -huh. you're an outdated stadium. We don't have an outdated one. So, and you got the rodeo, that complicates it mm -hmm. because you got an obligation to them. They're going to stay there whether the Spurs are there or not. So you got to run that thing. And if I got another arena three miles away, which they're talking about, you know, in that area, that's two arenas competing with each other in a very, very narrow, uh, short, sh short distance. Mm -hmm. And I think it'd be very hard for both of them to make money. Now, if they moved more out on the periphery, maybe if they moved a little bit north of downtown or north downtown, or you went over here to the south a little further away, maybe that makes a difference. But it's going to be difficult uh, to uh, run two arenas, uh, I think. But we'll see. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've, I've uh, just want to wait and see what the deal is, and we'll see what kind of a uh, uh, effort, how it's going to be paid for and how it's going to be done and county judge and the mayor are up to them to uh, figure it out and to come up with a plan that the community will support. Have you uh, given your successor, Peter Sakai, um, any advice? The only thing I've ever said to Peter, and I don't talk to him that often, he called me, I don't know, a couple months ago, I said, the only thing, uh, you better figure out what you're going to do with the facility you got. Uh, you know, if they do move, what is your plan? You know, you got to figure out how you're going to make it work financially. And that's the only thing I've ever said mm -hmm. to him. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that uh, caught my attention in the book was you you have a, a chapter uh, in which you say uh, a motion to delay can end up being a motion to kill. Yes. And it made me think uh, a lot of the chapters are kind of reminding me of things that have, you know, are happening now or happened a few years back. And I was thinking about what SASD is going through now because there's a because SASD is the, you know they're they're going through yeah. um, uh, a downsizing, yeah. uh, closing some schools, and uh, as we're recording this, the the, the, the SASD board is, is about to to decide on that. Yes, and there are people calling for a delay, to, saying yes. let's let's um, you know we need to take some more time to think about this. Given what you're saying about a motion delay can be a motion to kill. Um, how do you see that? They, they need to make a decision. Uh, I remember uh, meeting with the superintendent when he first came here. Mm -hmm. He said, you know what I've found? Decisions were not made 
to close some of the schools because we have, what, 20, 30,000 less students. I'm going to have to handle that. Mm -hmm. So he knew right when he came in, anybody that, I mean, if you're running a business and you got, yeah. you know, 20 or 30,000 less customers, you could have downsize. So they've got to downsize. Mm -hmm. And whether it's the number of schools that they are targeted now, whether it's a portion of those, they need to make a decision. It's not easy. It's very hard. But as we know, it could get even worse mm -hmm. if the voucher bill is passed in the, yeah. in the, in the Texas uh, House and Senate. Uh, then schools, public schools are going to suffer more. Um, and so they, they need to make those adjustments. They, uh, they've just got to do it. And, and like I say, I don't know the number of which schools are which, but they need to make a decision. We, we've known this for long enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a, a really interesting part of the book was when you talk about the 2020 Republican National Convention. Yeah. Uh, and you had uh, the Republican Party, their representative, I think it was in town, yes. was basically saying at, at, a, at a meeting with some local leaders. That's right. You know, San, this looks really good for San Antonio. We'd really like San Antonio to make a bid. And I think you had have a good chance. And you uh, write about the fact that former Mayor Phil Harberger uh, got up and uh, I, I guess he, he spoke and said. Spoke against it. He wasn't the only one. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know for sure at the time what Nuremberg was thinking. He never said in the meetings, but yeah. then he eventually called, called, called it off. You know, uh, obviously not a Trump guy. Yeah. <laughs> but. You know, we took the risk of the of the demonstrations that occurred during COVID with respect to the uh, 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 killing of uh, George Floyd. Yeah, uh huh. And so we went through that. Uh, and when I wrote that, I kept holding it, and I wondered, should I put this in the book? And then my friend Sylvester Turner, the mayor of Houston, <laughs> yeah. stepped up and said, "We're going to bring the Republican convention here this coming election." Or I think it's twenty twenty eight. They're going to yeah, do it. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and and could very well be, uh, be be the deal. So I thought, well, you know, put it in there because I thought we should have taken the chance to have it. It's a it's a huge economic benefit. They had like forty, you know, million bucks for security and. Uh, Trump would have only been here for a very short period of time. So I, I felt we should do that. Yeah. And 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 I think uh, former Mayor Harberger said he was concerned that there could be riots or there could be unrest. Yeah, well, you know? And one of the things that, that's, that's interesting about the book is that um, you point out that um, Mayor Nuremberg, his reason for opposing it yeah. at the time was he said that this the, the, it financially didn't work out. And and you're open in the book about saying that you just you don't That's believe not, that. And I, I have uh, to say I didn't either. I think he didn't he just didn't like the idea no, of he didn't of like Trump the idea in. and several and I don't think the council liked the idea. Yeah. But you gotta remember when we allowed all of these demonstrations in the middle of COVID, we did have a riot. Hmm. We handled it. And, but there was damage done to Houston Street. So uh we did it for that. I think we should have done it for the other free speech and assembly. Uh, you know, that's what this country's about. Um, and so I just thought that, uh, you know, we were wrong in not pursuing it. In your, I'm no, sorry, go no, no, go ahead. In your last principle, you, you, it's, you know, write it all down. Mm -hmm. And you're frank about saying one of the reasons you write it all down is sometimes to, to settle scores. Yeah. But beyond that, why is writing itself important to you and, and telling the histories that, that you do? Well, you know, it started with the mayor book, you mm -hmm. know, uh, after I finished that term, it took about two years to do that. And um, that sort of, you know, I, I don't keep a diary, but um, I, I write all the time. It's, it's a, convoluted mess of stuff that I <laughs> put in there. Um, just like I'm going to do one for Maryland. I'm going to do one for County Judge like I did that. And I was looking at some of my notes. I've got notes from 16 years ago, you know, on, the, on, on some of the county stuff. It's a, it's a habit I developed and uh, I enjoy it. Um, uh, it's a... Uh, uh, you know, it's an opportunity to say your side, to get your views over and let people decide whether that's right or wrong. Uh, it's therapeutic in another mm -hmm. sense uh, where people have 
kind of missed you around. You got a chance to <laughs> kind of kick back a little bit. <laughs> uh, Judge Wolf, before we wrap things up, I have to ask you about one of the uh, the, the chapters that, that fascinated me because I don't think I've seen a politician come out and say this, though I know that it's it's you're expressing something that's probably pretty common in politics. You talk about the need to um, when you're going to get revenge, yeah. do it. Uh, after, just wait, you know, <laughs> let, let some time pass and use proxies to do it for you. That's right. <laughs> and you give the example of Tom Rickoff, the former judge who yeah. ran against you. I think it was in 2018. Yes. And uh, you felt he had been unfair in his criticism of your record. Yeah. Uh, he had misrepresented your record. And no, so not only that, he took personal shots at he, my wife and me. And that's, that's true. Yeah, I remember that. Um, yeah. So you didn't respond in kind, but two years later, when he ran for county uh, commissioner, uh, your consultant, uh, Christian Archer, yeah. fed opposition research on him to uh, to one of his opponents. Was it was it Trista Berry? Is that who? I think that's right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you just had anything, just because I I think that's that was the fact that you put you you were open about that. It was, it was really well. You know, we had the opposition research, and there's another one in there. No one to keep your mouth shut. And uh, we were we were doing very well in the campaign, so yeah. I needed to use it. And uh, uh, though he had said some horrible things about my wife and me, and by the way, I pointed that guy county judge, county court alleged judge, and then he did this to me. Yeah. Uh, and so we had it, and I thought, well, I didn't need it, but maybe maybe she does. <laughs> <laughs> Was there also a feeling at that point uh, that that you had come to believe that he was just, he was irresponsible and you didn't want him serving on the, on the commissioner's court or I mean. Uh, there's no way I'd want him on yeah. that commissioner's court. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, or was it just, <laughs> be, I mean, was it, I, was it high-minded like that? You just don't want him serving on the court because you, you just didn't think he had the temperament or did you just want revenge? <laughs> Well, revenge is right. nice. Revenge is nice. I'm going to write that one down. <laughs> that might be the most important lesson here, I think, of, of all. Um, but, but I don't think he would have been a good member either. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just a happy marriage. <laughs> the two came together. <laughs> right. Judge Wolf, it's great having you on the podcast. Thank you so much. We really I appreciate it. it. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, thanks to everyone listening in. I hope you're doing well, and we'll be back next week. Take care. Revenge is nice. <laughs>